Okay, I guess I'll start. Um, before I start, who was at my talk at 12.30? Okay, there will be a tiny bit of overlap. Yeah. Uh, I'm at a NoSQL conference and I'm explaining about triples again and again. Okay, so I apologize in advance. Uh, next question, who is kind of familiar with RDF in this audience? Oh, that's good. Okay, that's more than half. All right. Um, but that means the other half, I still will do a little bit of tutorial work to explain what, what triples are all about. Okay, so in my, my name is Jan Saarsman. I work for a company called France Inc. And uh, our main product is a, uh, an RDF graph database. Um, and I will talk about 20 seconds about our, my company. Then I will go a little bit into what a graph database is. And then I will start with an example. Um, I will try to explain how a triple store is kind of a specialized form of graph database and, um, and what the difference is. And then most of my talk will be about some use cases of uh, an idea of graph database. So first we'll talk about uh, supply chain management in a, for a car manufacturer. Um, we will talk about a reporting platform for in the oil industry in Norway. Uh, and we talked about a telecom customer called MDOX that is uh, uh, building a platform that knows literally everything about you as a customer. Uh, so those are the three main use cases. I'll talk a little bit about why people use graph databases, when you should use them, when you shouldn't use them. And, uh, and I guess that's about it. Um, I like interactive presentations, so if you want to interrupt me, uh, be my guest. I, I, I like that a lot. Okay, so we're a company started in 84. Um, we've always been in the Lisp and AI business, and for the last eight years we've been fully engaged in semantic uh, technology. Um, started out of Berkeley and we're now in Oakland. Um, then about graph databases, I kind of had prepared a lot more about graph databases, but I see that this NoSQL conference is actually a graph a, a, a graph database uh, a conference. So anyway, I don't have to say too much about it. I'm not even going to explain it. You know it. Yeah, things linked by, by, by links. That's about it. And there's a lot of graph databases. This morning there were some talks about it. So again, it's a big list of <coughs> um, products that are, we'll call themselves graph databases. And it's kind of a mix between um, in-memory store and non-memory stores. RDF, triple stores, and graph databases from the Wikipedia. Now, what is the difference between a relational database and a graph database? So, <clears throat> for years I've now been using this little example. I say, if you want to represent uh, a person in your database, and you have a bunch of one-to-many relationships, like the fact that you have multiple spouses in your life, multiple schools, multiple uh, children, et cetera, et cetera. Before you know it, you have a whole bunch of tables and link tables. Um, in a <coughs> graph database, you can represent the same information as nodes with links in between them. Yeah. That's, uh, so it's not rows and columns, it's basically triples and nodes and links combining them. How is it different? Why is it more flexible? Well, in a uh, graph database, there's no schema. You can say whatever you want to say. There's no link tables. Uh, because one too many relationships are, are just native to, data, to these graph databases. There's no indexing choices because everything gets indexed. Uh, that's not entirely true, but let's keep it at for now. And it's a very low level representation of your data. So basically you can take almost everything else and turn it into a graph representation. And then the triple store is just a specialization. So in a <coughs> if you so in, if you take look at the nodes and the links in a RDF triple store, then the nodes are always URLs, yeah? So you basically can put them out somewhere on the web and dereference them and get more information back. And the predicates are URLs too. So, and these URLs are unique. So you can have databases with RDF in them all over the world, and as long as you use unique names, you kind of can combine them and you can create a knowledge graph. So let me give you a little demo, and I'll do a different demo for the people that saw my demo at, uh, at 12.30. <coughs> Usually I give a a great demo uh, from the pharmaceutical domain, but let me do one about news right now. So, <coughs> the linked, who, who knows about the linked open data cloud here? All of you by now, yeah? So, 
You probably also know that Facebook, Bing, and Google are building their own uh, propriety knowledge, knowledge graphs where they take all the people they can find, organizations they can find, uh, places, important events, and all link them together. Yeah, so that you can an incredible big encyclopedia of almost everything in the world. And you can use that to make your search better, to give better answers, etc. But there's also been a public version of that for a long time now, actually before the knowledge graphs uh, from the big guys, and we called it linked open data. And if you want to have a great explanation of linked open data and why it's so fantastic, go to TED Talks and search for Tim Berners-Lee and he will give this wonderful talk about why we should take all the data in the world, turn it into RDF, make sure that the names link up and we get this, this web of data yeah, that will give answers to all our questions. Um, and again, what I already said, the most important thing is make sure that all the nodes in your graph are unique identifiable URLs. So this movement started in the well, in 2007, we already had a whole bunch of databases. Just this one in the middle, DBpedia, has more than 300 uh, million triples for the English language. It's the, the triple version of the Wikipedia. Who, who does not know about DBpedia? Okay, so they take, you take the Wikipedia, you take the info boxes and some extra, and you represent all the information just as, as triples, and then it gets republished. Now, you see links, so for example, there's also um, a thing here called GeoNames, which is about 150 million triples, and it's the triple version of uh, GeoNames.org. GeoNames is an organization that has all the places in the world uh, with their alternative names in other languages, with the latitude and the longitude, how many people live there, the classification of that particular place. Yes, it's a huge database. And what you see is that there's links between all these things. So for example, DBpedia will talk about Berlin, um, but one of the triples will say Berlin has GeoNames ID and then the number, and then the GeoNames database will have that H and an address with that number, and a lot of extra information. So all these databases kind of link together. And so this was in 2007. This is now in 2000. This is in 2010. Uh, the 2012 is too big. I can't show it on the screen anymore. At least, well, even this is not readable anymore. But and this is, by the way, also awful colors compared to my screen. But, so this is probably 20 billion triples, all from the pharmaceutical domain. So all the genes, descriptions, uh, protein descriptions, drugs, diseases, uh, what, what do you have, whatever you have. This is publication data, all the green stuff, which is not green for you, I guess. This is uh, multimedia, multimedia information. The government is putting a lot of efforts in taking their data sets and making them available as RDF. Um, and even stores are now putting all the inventory out as RDF. So it's a, a big movement to make data available. So how can you use that stuff? So, and this is my demo. So I have um, here a tool called Gruff. It's a free tool. You can download it from my website. And what it does, it uh, allows you to load data sources from the web put it into database, and then explore. Um, so at some point I made a new triple store, at some point I loaded some files from the web. Um, and so what I did for, did for this demo is I took, um, uh, so I have a, we have a crawler that you can kind of intelligently steer. And so one of my hobbies is to take all the politicians in the United States and I go every day to Google and Bing and I get all the new news articles about these politicians. Yeah, I collect them, then I apply an entity extract to get the place names, people names, organization names, and other important things out of there. And then, for example, for every place name, I link the place name to geo names, so now I have the latitude and the longitude. And for every person that I find, I go to DBpedia, or to contactingthecongress.org, which is all the politicians' names. And so I rich enrich my data set, so I go from just a blob of text to more precise uh, places, organizations, people as triples, link that to other data sets, and suddenly I can do very intelligent questions on these data sets. So, and this is one day, this is not about politicians, this, one here. this is just one day of Google News. And so this was in 2010, so I can look for, say, Obama and health care. 
And this is for one day. I found three articles. So now you see three triples that have the words Obama and healthcare in it. I can look at one of them. And here you see some examples of triples. So text 177, look at the bottom, by the way, that it's a URL. This is just a read-all version. It has a concept, COBRA. I guess all Americans know what that is. This is some triples that describe the categories of this particular text. Um, at the bottom, you see some people that I found in this particular text. And then I went to DBpedia to find more information about each of these people. So I got um, some, okay, oh yeah. I got some linked data names back, people that I found from DBpedia. So I can look at, say, Mike Morona. And here I see more information about this particular person in my database. I also have a bunch of place names, so I can go to a particular place that I found, and I linked it up with geonames, and so I have more information about that. Does that make sense? Yes, so um, I can go back to the graph view. I see these text, and I can, I can say, okay, I want to explore the graph um, in, this, you know, on this in this particular, um, well, let me say it in a different way. I want to explore the graph, but I want to choose the way I go through my graph. So I say, well, I'm only interested in the people, the places, and the organizations, both going out and coming into a particular concept. So I choose those, and now I can s click on this guy here. Uh, this, is, this is such a small screen, let me just do this. So these texts are related through these things, yes? Yeah? So we see these different texts. We see how the graph connects. I can take a completely different topic like the CIA. And somehow there will be a few texts about the CIA. And I can say, so how does this text about the CIA ultimately link somehow to the text about Obama and healthcare through these three predicates that I chose? So I just can say, well, let's see how does this guy relate, State Department. Well, that's not very exciting. This gets already more exciting. And anyway, you, can, you get the point. Yeah? So I can ask the database to find connections between concepts and, 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 and find a shortest path based on what I want to see in the shortest path. So this is the, uh, the graph part of the data that I have. Now let me show you why I can do some more intelligent queries. So um, first I'll show you a Sparkle query. So Sparkle is the query language of the web. Basically, if you know SQL, you probably can read it. You say select every distinct text in X where the text has a name X and this X has the word net type scientist. Yeah. So when I look that, do that, I can do a query. I find a number of, um, of scientists that were in the news that particular day. Now please realize that this is already powerful because I just took a text, I took the people names out. But the text, of course, doesn't say for every person that's a scientist. But I figured out it was a scientist because I took the person name, went to DBPD, and found their role in some particular way. Yeah? So this is already something where you show the, the power of, uh, of enriching your data with other data somewhere else in the world. But I can go deeper. I can do this. I can say, um, I can do this query. I can say, well, give me every text uh, that has a city, yeah, and then, well, give me every text that has a place name that is within 100 miles of Tampa. That is the first line. Now, for each of these texts, find if there's a scientist in the data, and if there's a scientist in the data, then give me the title of this article. Yeah. So this is a, a query where, where I now do two things. One is I, f I look at the role of people by looking somewhere else, but I also looked at the latitude and longitudes of place names. So I can do now um, geospatial search too in the same query, and I can do the query, and then there's only one guy left here um, from text 540. I could look at this text, I'll actually do it with this. So this was the text about this particular guy. Anyway, you get the point, I hope. Any questions about this so far? It's a, it's a, it's a good demo of, of, of the integration possibilities and ad hoc discovery. Um, you mentioned Tim Berners-Lee, and uh, one of the examples he talks about is a uh, fidelity example where you've got these um, enormous numbers of columns, and you can filter on any, any, any selection of those columns. Is there a similar capability that, that uh, 
the Gruff or Allegra Gruff might have to do that kind of filtering as well? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that works uh, straight out of the box. Straight out of the box. Yeah, yeah. We can talk offline about it. There's okay. a lot to say about that. Sorry, yeah. What about issues of data scrubbing, right? You've got all this data in the system, and how do you gauge its accuracy and kind of put it in? But um, aren't there ways to cross reference or do some. You know, well, well, there's lots of data, data scrubbing going on because um, one is if you get the text in HTML pages, there's so much junk around it. So it's already a hard task it. just to get the text out of it. And there's actually a, a great new company startup in in the Bay Area. I forgot the name. Dig? Oh, no, not. What they do is they apply visual recognition techniques to a web page. So, so it's like a human being looking at a web page and say, well, oh, this needs to be the text that people want to read. Yeah, because it's because if you look inside, you see all these diffs and God knows what, and it's just um, anyway. That's one technique. Uh, that we're looking at to make that more fine-grained. But the other thing is, is uh, how do you, so you find Bill Smith in your text. Yeah? How do you know which Bill Smith in the DPPD is this? So there's all kinds of techniques being developed, like you look at some of the words around Bill Smith in the newspaper article, then you go to the DPPD, to his description, and if you find, you find the one you do, um, what's the name of this technique? Anyway, you take the words, you take the words around <coughs> for that person, this, and then you look at the. You're talking about gaining a confidence level, huh? the confidence Yeah, level it's just a conf it's level. just about confidence level. This bill must be this particular. This must be the box boxing guy, or the politician, or the entertainment guy. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely a lot of good work that, that goes into making this more and more reliable. Um, so this is, is this okay? So this is one. Um, little use case, but this is, um, and by the way, I have this great politics demo that I sometimes give, and politicians and lobby groups are really interested in this particular technology. But let me go back to my, so who uses this in the enterprise? Yes, so what companies use this in the enterprise? Well, about half our customers are in DOD and the intelligence uh, agencies. And uh, we're now, right now, at version 4.8 with our products, and we've had customers that bought version 1.0 and 2.0, and it was still almost like a toy thing from, the, uh, from version 3. We had the first production, now we're at 4, so it's, it's like uh, we've got a lot of help from the DoD community, just keeping us alive and getting better and better at, at what we do. Um, lots of stories here, but let's not go in there. And then there's um, commercial customers all over the place that's in hospitals, are getting really interested in this, like a medical device management or getting a 360 overview of your, of your uh, patients. Um, media companies like to have a lot of metadata about the products that they have. Uh, pharmaceutical companies have the, by far the most complex data that you can imagine. They're all interested in this, this, in, in, uh, in this technology. But I'm going to talk about these three use cases. MDocs, a telco platform that knows almost everything about every customer in real time. About a car manufacturer, I, I'm under NDA, I can't say too much about it, but this is a great case. And about EPIM, a reporting platform for about 31 oil companies in, uh, in Norway. So let me start with MDocs. So, um, I mean, Telephone companies are almost the scariest companies in the world from a privacy point of view, yeah? because they know who you talk to, they have your location. If you take the location that of people and who they talk with, and you have good GIS databases and know where things are, then basically you can figure out where you, well, where you live, of course, they have your billing address, but where you live, how many people live in your household, uh, your, your gender, because you know the gender, because you know kind of stores you go to, your religion, um, friends, and that's of course all. But what they also want to know is if I'm going to call the call center, what are the things that you're going to call about? Because I mean, telephone companies lose a lot of money by just wasting time with the customer trying to figure out what's wrong. They now can figure out in great detail uh, what you're going to call about even before you call. So anyway, so what we did there in this project is you take information from more than 40 different databases yeah, 
Events happen there. As soon as an event happens, you turn it into a few triples that describe that particular event. It goes into a staging area, and for each event, you kind of recompute the state of your customer. And so we get up to five to 10,000 triples per customer that describe everything about you. So it's, and it's not just this, the simple things, but it's also subjective information, like you're a good payer, or you're an angry customer, you know, or patterns like this guy always pays five days late, but at least he pays. And this guy, you have trends, you have geospatial things, you have temporal uh, probabilities, absence of occurrence, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a marketer's dream. How it works is that, um, and I'll just go very quickly through this, and I'll put this on a website too, so don't worry. Yeah, um, we start with all these data sets. <coughs> yeah, structured data, unstructured data. Whenever something happens, we instantly unify it by taking a few triples. We put this in this particular staging area. And then whenever something happens, um, we see, oh, this is, a, this is an event for a particular person. We get all the triples we have about that particular person, get it into memory. Uh, we apply hundreds of business rules. Then, and, and those business rules will create uh, new triples or delete triples about a particular person. And then we also take the state of the customer and put it through a Bayesian belief network to do some predictions like, is this guy going to switch from telephone company A to telephone company B? B. What are the three most likely reasons what you were going to call about when you call up the call center? Um, will you actually pay your bill, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah? When you say you apply hundreds of business rules, are these business rules that you have collected and you have to uh, identify? Or is it that you've already principally put there are all of these business rules um, in the product? I uh, know. Well, For every industry, you have to develop the business rules. So you start with the basic concepts like, yeah, this is, um, Basically, it sounds like you can define business rules. Yeah, but you start out with, a, with, you have concepts like a bill and a payment and a customer and a device. And then you, st that's low level. That's something we, we turn into rules so that the people that write the business rules don't have to go every, every time to go all the way down to the level of triples, but we, we create high level concepts and there we have a mechanism where we, in fairly high level language, can describe policies about what to do. And I, when I say we apply hundreds of business rules, it's actually not true. Because if, if A calls B, yeah, then we say, oh, we only have to call the rules that are about people calling. And then we update the frequency of your social network. Uh, we apply the current balance, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? But all in all, this is four or 500 rules in the system. Um, OK, so that's the first use case. Any more questions about that? Um, OK, the second one is uh, risk in the supply chain management. Um, and we did this as a proof of concept for one car company. And we see a lot of industries that all have the same problem. So let me just describe it. So, so um, your car company, and you see that there is a um, a flood somewhere in the world and you ask your fender for parts like, uh, is this going to affect me? And the fender will always say, oh, no, no, don't worry, no problems. Yeah? Until one day you say, sorry, I run out of that particular part because your competitor bought it all. Yeah? So <clears throat> because you have this just-in-time logistics for, 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 for car companies, but a lot of other products, yeah, you're really scared if anything can disrupt your supply chain. So and this is a list of questions yeah, that almost every manufacturer is interested in. Um, anyway, I'm not going to read that list. Yeah? Can you go through um, a hypothetical? So for instance, if you went through like a simulation that said if an earthquake took place here, how would that be affected? Those would be good questions to ask. Yes, I'll, I'll get to that point. Okay. Uh, or let me, I think I'll get to the point. If not, then interrupt me, OK? So um, we wanted to be able to answer these questions. And so for that, we had to bring together three clouds of data. Um, you start out with the bills of material for a particular car. Yeah? Um, so these, these, these car companies have a bill of material. They have actually nice booklets that describe every part. Yeah? It's like a hierarchy, a taxonomy of all the parts that they have. 
and then they know for each part where they buy it from. So they call them the first tier, offend first tier offenders. Um, and you even have a parts inventory. inventory. Um, so that's, that's one cloud of data that you have to bring together and link up. Um, then you want to look at the supply chain for the first tier vendors. Now the problem is the, your first tier vendors won't tell you where they get their stuff from. So this is actually a really hard problem. Yeah? If you're called Walmart or you're called the uh, United uh, States Air Force, then you can ask that question and get an answer. For example, uh, if you look at the nuclear engines in a submarine, then they actually know down to the last screw from what steel mill this particular screw came from. Yeah? Because they really want to know all the way down, all the, the people in the middle. But for most of the, the world, it's really hard to figure out. So that's a lot of work. Yeah? So who sells the subparts? And then if you get the sub, you go all the way down from the fence, sub vendors, sub sub vendors to the producers, uh, you also want to know where they are, you know, where they are located. Yeah? Um, so that's the second cloud. And then finally, what you have to do is what I just described in my demo. Yeah? You want to spider for every producer and sub vendor and, and, and vendor on the web every day and get news about these vendors. But you also want to spider the countries, like you want to spider Japan and, and, and Thailand and, and whatever, every country in the world. And you want to look for problems with commodities, you want to look for natural disasters, you want to look for political unrest, and you bring that together in the database. Yeah, so well, this is just a picture of how this all kind of ties together in the, in the supply chain. It's nice, but let me not talk about it. Um, and then what I'm going to show you is how this kind of all ties together. So let me, let me just show you. We have a company who buys an exhaust muffler uh, from a fender who buys it finally from someone in Bangkok. There's news in, in, Thailand, in this, uh, a newspaper article that says that there's floods in Bangkok. Um, and Defender is in Bangkok, we have a risk. So this is, I just showed you graph so you now recognize what's here on the screen. Yes, so you go all the way down from the particular part to the in-between company. This is, by the way, made up data in this case. To this particular part, to where it was made, to Thailand, where there was a particular newspaper article that talked about flood in Bangkok. And then this is a kind of rule that we have. Yeah. So we say, <coughs> There is a natural disaster warning for a particular uh, vendor in a part. If there is a text for a particular country where this country has a place, where this place has a vendor, and where the vendor produces a particular part. Um, does it make sense? Yeah. So this ties all these things together. So now I go with my query through all the three clouds to, to, to kind of figure out that there is a particular risk. Has, sorry, well, has danger word means could be it's like a political unrest or uh, a flood or anything. Does, it, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I have another one. But you also want to do simulations where you say, yeah. okay. When you're speaking of clouds, going through three different clouds, does that mean you have two different data sets that are maintained by different people that you're querying and pulling together through this query? Uh, when I say cloud, I, I mean it in a very impressionistic way. I mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I basically mean, I mean, this. Three areas okay. where you have to collect data. It's, it's in the fender part, it's in this big world in between, and it's in the world of, of, of news. Yeah, that's why I mean three, three domains where you have to do all kinds of different work to all. In which case, it could be hundreds of data sets. Oh, yeah, it could be hundreds but of data sets, yeah. It's, so it's a scale out methodology, right? Across hundreds of data sets that are different sets of servers? Well, the, the first two clouds are. Just, and I'm not that incredibly big. I mean, that's just a few tens of millions. But the, the text will get bigger and bigger. But fortunately, the text is also mostly, you're only worried about the now. Yeah, You might want to do historic analysis, but you're not interested in a flood in Bangkok three years ago. You want to know about the last few days. So it's, it, it's just a few 10 to 100 million triples will cover this particular problem. Now. I've been thinking about this. If you, you could offer this as a service to many industries, and then of course you get a huge cloud, because then you have to track many vendors, many products, many commodities, many disasters. Um, yeah? Are there three Sparkle endpoints in that particular case or one? No, no, it's all in one huge database. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. So, what I, when I gave you this demo, 
it is federated, but if you federate on the same machine, then performance will be just the same. Federation over multiple machines is going to sl slow you down, but if you ke can keep your databases in the same server, on the same, then we actually keep all these databases separated because it's much easier to manage. Yeah, if you just put one big, big massive amount of triples, then and you want to make big changes, there's a lot of administrative work. If you can keep, just keep it nicely separated, then it's easier to manage. How much more time do I have? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Um, so then an, another project uh, that we did, and that's now in production, is for, oh, something pushed. It's, it's um, for a consortium in Norway. Um, so in Norway, in, in almost like in, in every country, you have a, a bunch of oil producers that have rigs in the sea or in the ocean and they produce something every day and the government wants to know if a re what's have report how much you produced at any point in time and if there were any problems in the oil rigs etc etc so <clears throat> but of course the government doesn't tell you what data format you have to give them so some people give you a text or an email or an xml or a little bit of a database so it's it's a mess and so EPIM is an organization, it's a non-profit organization in Norway that's kind of being sponsored by all the oil companies that has the, ta that has the ta task of taking care of the IT of this platform to kind of report to the government every day about the production. Um, so here are the oil companies that all take part in this, in this effort. And so this is one way where you use semantic technology. You, um, uh, Basically, it's a, it's a really nice way to integrate data. Yeah? You start with multiple forms. It's XML, in this case, XML, XML, Excel, relational databases. You create a mapping from the XML to the triples you want to have. So then you get mapping rules in the models. You put everything in, an, in, in a repository. And then we have all kinds of output templates to ultimately produce then XML or Excel, HTML, or JSON, or whatever you want to have. And it's a very heavy ontology-driven project. Who's familiar here with ontologies? Oh, great. I don't have to explain that. But there's, um, we work with a partner here called Top Quadrant, uh, also here in the Valley. Um, they have some really great tools to um, create ontologies. And they have this, this ultimate dream that you can build applications by just specifying all the ontologies on every layer of your application and then it should create, turn into a runnable model. That's like, um, and so we apply that methodology in this project, but it goes too deep to kind of try to explain it all now. Um, I hope this is kind of picture tells you some of how this all fits together. Okay, so then the question, um, when do you want a graph, a graph <coughs> database or triple store, or when do you use a SQL database or a NoSQL database or, um, so I get this question, of course, all the time. And, and at my talk at 12.30, I talked about it in great detail. Uh, but let me redo it shortly here. <clears throat> um, I'm here at the NoSQL conference. So if you're not using, if you're not going to use, I mean, OK, let me take a step back. Many times when I talk to potential customers and they describe the problem to me, I, my first question is, why don't you use a SQL database? Your, your, your ontology is not that complicated. Oh, sorry, your schema is not that complicated. Um, looks fairly regular. You don't make many changes over time. So why not stay with SQL? Yeah, because if I get a customer that was happy with SQL goes to a graph database, there will be disappointments because some of the things that rela relational databases do are really good. You know, I mean, they've worked for 30 years on making joins very fast. And, um, but okay, if they can convince me that their, did, that their application is, is really complex and there's a lot of changes over time and there's a graph in the data, yeah, then of course they have, to, they have still a lot of choices. They can go to any kind of NoSQL database, yeah, um, or they can take uh, one of the modern graph databases, or you can go to a triple store. So I tried to make this picture uh, that a lot of people seem to like about when to use what. So if you have billions of same type objects you need to retrieve them extremely fast, then NoSQL databases will really work fine. If you have a 
kind of a fixed size static data set and you need fast graph computations of pattern matching, then you've, you can use the Cray solution, Neo4j or Lego graph and do graph search. But if you need to work with, um, if you need all the, all the features of a relational database, um, so you want to be asset and, trans, and transactional, uh, but you also want to be ontology driven, you need a lot of rule applications, then a RDF triple store makes a lot of sense to use. So, um, so here I'm trying to summarize it. When you use a graph database, when you need an ultimate in flexibility, yeah, so you, you model knowledge and assets, hundreds of thousands of classes of different features, every day new classes and new features, when you need ultimate linkability, uh, when you need pattern recognition and network analysis, then you probably should consider looking at a, um, an idea of triple store. And finally, the last point, when you need event processing. We've spent a lot of time to deal with events where you have a geospatial component, a temporal component, and social network analysis. Yeah, so we, um, let me go here. In our triple store, we um, have a simple event ontology, so we can have events like a, a meeting, a telephone call, a financial transaction. Every event always has a list of actors. If it's a payment, you have two actors or even three. Uh, if you go through someone else, um, telephone call, whatever you can think of, there's always actors. There's always a place where something happens. Sometimes just this point event, but most of the time it's got duration and then a lot of other things that describe events. So if you, if you live in a world of events, <coughs> yeah, then we provide very detailed social network analysis. We implement almost a complete handbook of social network analysis. Yeah, so we can, the kind of questions you can do here, how far is P1 from P2, to what groups does this person belong, how important is this person in the group, or does this group have a leader or not. We do geospatial, so we're not as uh, extensive as, say, Oracle with geospatial. What we do very well is proximity search. So you say, I take one point, give me all the points that are within a certain radius. That is what we kind of specialize in. And then we do a little bit of, of uh, uh, polygons, but not, not, not all the things that Oracle can do. But what we do is really very fast. Um, then we do temporal reasoning. So um, most people probably know about Allen logic for time. Yeah. If you have two intervals, there's 13 ways they can relate to each other, and if you add points, then it's a little bit more. What we do is we provide a, um, a whole bunch of functions that will make it very easy to talk both about time and about place in the same query. So we can do queries like this, um, find all the meetings that happened in November within five miles of Berkeley that was attended by the most important person, Jans' friends and friends of friends. Yeah? So in one query, I'm doing a social network analysis, Yes, so I'm the first one. Um, I said, give me the ego group around Jans, two levels deep. Then give me uh, the most important people back. So the actor centrality is one of the measures in social network theory that says a person is more important in the group if he's more central to the group. So anyway, you find the most important person and give me every event for this particular actor, yeah, where the event is a meeting and then where this event happened in a particular time in the fall and happened within five miles of Berkeley. Yeah. I try to do that in, um, in a NoSQL store yeah, or in, in almost any other technology. And it works really well in a IDF graph database. And I guess that was it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so any more questions? Yeah. Um. <coughs> I worked with, with Sparkle for a while and had tried some rules with Squirrel in the past, and performance was too tough for general rules. And so I'm kind of out of date on this now. But you have some kind of rule support, and what, what kind of rule support? And how, uh, you know, we, in practice, where you know what, what performance can you get out of it? Um, we provide full prolog in our database. Prolog is the perfect match for for triples. So I can do everything. I can do Sparkle plus a million things more with uh, with Prolog. If you're not afraid of Prolog, <laughs> um, at some point we're probably going to have Riff or some other. But right now, if you really want to, we have some Spin uh, that we now support. So Spin is another way to do simple rules. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to do anything really complex, then Prolog is still your best bet. And this afternoon I talked about a new 
uh, in-memory architecture where so so no, let's that's too deep. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> yeah. So in the SQL conference, we talk a lot about scale out and, and scale up, scale down, yeah. that type of thing. Can you talk a little bit about the features that you have in the product that support that? Yeah, so that was what my talk was about at 12:30. So we're working on a horizontal scaling that uses the principles of Hadoop to distribute the triples based on the hash of the first part of the triple, and depending on how you index. And then we have a technology where we can take a, a Sparkle query and turn it automatically in some really fancy MapReduce. So you can write declarative statements. You don't have to write a bunch of Java code. You just specify your query and it turns into a, a pipeline. Now this is something that we're, it's in, in, in research. I can, we can show you demos if you want to. Um, but that's how we deal with that part. If you, if you but we, can, we do federation so you can do you can have a bunch of triple stores and you can do queries against the, the triple stores. But of course, that's, that's not as fast as then if you have a really distributed version. Yeah? Just a quick question. Jeff Kirk's trying to cast on um, is Amdocs making use of any of the social network analysis that you were talking about? They, they keep, yeah, they keep uh, a list of the most important people around you plus the frequency. So they very quickly can say, who are, you, who are your most important people? Uh -huh. But they, so it's just all in there and the marketeers can use it for whatever they want to do. Yeah, um, yeah because one, one, one thing they found out, if you can find out what the most important person is in a group of people, and if the most important person buys something, there's something like a very high probability that at least two other people in the group also will buy the same product. So you want to be very nice to the most per <laughs> most important. And, huh? and if they churn, they take people with them. That's and if they churn, if they go away, then they take people with them. So it's, um, it's very important that you know the social network around people. Plus you have these friends and family programs and you can choose. You can make plans based on the fact that if you get your friends in the network, in my network, then I will give you this, this discount. So this All right. Well, thanks.